a few years later, um, his, uh, his son was president, the second George Bush, and um, maybe not as strong an advocate as his father. So we'll watch this. This is a little a humorous clip um, when, uh, that, that described a, a change in policy of that Bush administration. Lands in America to having an overall increase of America's wetlands over the next five years. So he was, so rhetorically, he was saying, yeah, my dad was right, but I want to do that even better. So instead of just holding the line at our wetland loss, we want to, um, to grow our wetlands. Unfortunately, the way it played out was, again, as you saw Stephen Colbert making, doing satire on it, um, uh, they redefined what a wetland is to include all these things that really are not functioning wetlands, but, but when you add them all up, numerically add to increased acreage. So on paper, it looked like we were doing great. Whereas if you use the old definition, our wetlands were continuing to decline. So we'll, t we'll, we'll touch on that more later, but, but um, from a rhetorical standpoint, it's important to note that even though um, the second Bush administration maybe was not as actively protecting wetlands and supporting wetland restoration, for example, as we maybe would like, they nevertheless saw the rhetorical value of saying that they cared about wetlands and saying that they were protecting wetlands. Um, that is, that seems to have changed uh, in, in recent years. So now um, we're back to, unfortunately, in a lot of our political discourse, this notion of wetlands as bad things or as waste of, wastes of lands. And, and the rhetoric that is most commonly used right now in terms of the federal government and, and powers that be um, revolve around um, the, uh, the so-called swamp, with the swamp having a negative connotation. So President Trump refers to one to drain the swamp, right? So that, that whole notion is, is messed up on a bunch of levels, I would suggest, right? Because because we don't, we shouldn't be draining our swamps, right? We should be making sure our swamps have water, but it comes from that very old, you know, pre-60s, pre-1970s idea of wetlands as dangerous things, as, as wetlands of harbingers of badness, disease, uh, you know, uh, of vapors, as they used to call it. And so by draining the swamp, you make it smell better, you make there be no mosquitoes, et cetera. Um, and we can talk about you know, whether uh, swamps have, you know, rhetorical swamps have actually been drained or not, but, but uh, nevertheless, this idea resurfaces, resurfaces, resurfaces. And um, perhaps because of the rhetoric that's being used, people's perceptions of wetlands may or may not be changing, but they, they in some areas, they might be uh, degrading to um, some of the old historic uh, views of wetlands. Does that make sense? Questions? That, that, was a, that was a quick little introduction to wetland rhetoric. Any questions about any of those examples or maybe wondering about anything? No, okay. Okay, so it's, so it's, uh, it's, it's your turn. Um, I think what we'll do though, since we're, uh, well, no, I guess we could, we could do this. So um, I was gonna give you guys 20 minutes. I think what we'll do is because time, we only have about 15 minutes for our break. I think I'll give you guys 15 minutes for this exercise and then I'll call everybody back in right at, uh, at, at uh, I was going to give you 20 minutes. So I'll call you back in at 15 minutes and see how we're doing. We can take our break and then figure out how much more time we need after our break to finish us up. So um, if you guys will uh, look in your, um, look in the chat, I will repost it again in the chat. Uh, where are we? I will repost it again in the chat. But um, here is a Google Doc. So if everybody could click on that link, uh, here is the, the link. And we're going to be doing a, a little quick uh, rhetorical search ourselves um, uh, in this next exercise. So the question, so I've broken the groups up into different time periods. So group one is 1800s, group two is 1900 to 1930, et cetera. So I'm going to assign you guys randomly to groups. When you're in a group, uh, 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 scroll down to see what, what your group number is, and then you'll know what your, what your um, time period is. What you're going to do is you're going to find three examples of wetland rhetoric from that time period, original stuff. 
um, now this could be anything. This could be a political cartoon. This could be um, a film. This could be a painting. This could be a, a excerpt from a news story or some writing or whatever. Um, that there's references wetlands and it could be wetland. You could search for wetlands, swamps, you know, you can be a very broad net. Um, uh, you can look wherever you want uh, and you're gonna do this as a group. Remember you do this as a group. Um, so uh, places to, some places to think about starting to search maybe. Um, I wouldn't, I probably wouldn't just do Google because Google will just give you, it's not the best. Um, we want to get the original rhetoric that people were, were utilizing. So things like Library of Congress is a great place to search. Uh, National Museum of Art or other museums for wetland or marsh or swamp type thing. Uh, USGS, uh, any newspaper, LA Times, New York Times, whatever, um, you know, can search their, their archives for articles. Uh, historical societies, internet movie data, internet movie database, etc. So I don't care where you guys search, but you're going to find some original rhetoric. You're going to, um, and you're going to, and each group is going to find three examples. So you guys can do this as a group, so you can divide and conquer, as it were, or you guys can all strategize for a few minutes and then divide and conquer, however you want to do it. Um, so you're going to tell us the the title of whatever this thing is, this 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 news article or this painting or whatever. Um, provide a link to it so we can go look at it if we want. Um, and then a little excerpt, so either, either um, the, the uh, excerpt from the text or a little bit of the description, something of that nature. And then it says one, three. I, I don't know what the heck happened there. It should be, um, uh, oh, I got you. Sorry, sorry. Three sentence summary is what I wanted. So, so up to a three sentence summary, just a one sentence or so. What does the image say? What does the rhetoric say? You know, what are the terms used, et cetera? So you're gonna um, give us uh, one example, two example, three examples. If you guys are the 1800s group, you can do the same thing if you're the 1900 to 1930s group, et cetera, um, and go forward. Does that make sense, you guys? Yes, yes. Okay, so again, the goal here is wetland rhetoric, wetland defined broadly. You can use the term wetland, you can use whatever term you want, and, and you can use whatever modality. So I'm gonna, uh, give me a second, and I'm going to throw everybody in breakout rooms in one second. Ready, set, go. So I'll bring everybody back in uh, just before uh, uh, 10 o'clock. All right, team, we got about 20 seconds left for everybody else to come back in. Hopefully everybody has your break, your 10-minute break. Bigger? Yeah, let's make this bigger. Let's make this bigger. Okay, looks like everybody's back. Awesome. Thanks, you guys. Hopefully that went well. Um, so why don't we, uh, to finish this up and, and to see if we have seen any change, um, I mean, granted, it's relatively small sample size. Might be a little biased here with our sampling, but nevertheless, let's see what the what the results show. So maybe um, what I want to do next is each group can just give us a quick, uh, you know, two minute summary or so, two, three minute summary of, of the, the rhetoric they found and I'll, we can scroll through it and uh, just sort of give us the sense of um, what the rhetoric was like in your time period. So how about, oh, I'm so sorry. do you want this to go in order from, I mean, starting with the 1800s? On yeah. or does it matter? Yeah, yeah. So, so I, so I got, so I'm. If you guys can see, hopefully my screen is sharing now. But I got. Uh, I'll just scroll through the document. And you guys can, you guys can tell me to advance or whatever, and, and and you guys can describe what what it is. We'll start with the oldest and we'll go to the youngest. So group one. Oh wait, group one. You guys didn't type in your your people, who was in your group. So uh, uh, after we finish up your summary, you guys can go back in and, and type that in. But uh, whoever was group one. You guys want to start telling us what what you found? Oh yeah, sorry. Uh, name's Mitron. Uh, so I found this picture um, in the Library of Congress. It's just a bunch of hunters, kind of like using the wetland mm -hmm. for like hunting purposes. Mm -hmm. um, they have like hunting dogs, and like they're just kind of using the land um, in a way we wouldn't necessarily want it like today, I guess. Okay, so so extraction, traditional extraction from the wetlands. Okay, cool. 
Uh, what about, what, what are some of the other ones you guys found or some of the other rhetoric you found? Um, so this is a photo of the United States and it shows the notable wetland loss between the 1800s and the 1860s. And then the chart next to it is actually a chart. Um, it shows the um, states that were protected by the Swamp Land Act where they um, gave swamp land and overflow land to the state for reclamation. Good, so, so here's this essentially non-valuable land. You guys go make some, something valuable from it. Okay, cool. Uh, and you guys have one more? And this, this is a, a photograph of a swamp near Appomattox River in Virginia. Um, it was taken by a, a photographer who, who was um, commissioned to make war photos during the Civil War. Uh -huh. um, so this, this was like nearby one of the battlegrounds and kind of shows like the, the state of the swamp at, at this time in history. Okay. Cool. Okay, so, so it's very much sort of, uh, it sounds like wetlands of the, this era were very much uh, kind of a feature of life and we might want to sort of uh, uh, feature of life in terms of the environment, feature of life in terms of how people, where people found food and sustenance, um, but then uh, also this encouragement to transform them. Okay, cool. How about, how about group number two? You guys want to tell us about what you guys found? So in this picture, this picture shows um, all the states that have lost over 70% or have had their wetlands altered by mm -hmm. at least 70% mm -hmm. to turn into drainage um, or uh, if you scroll a little bit down, I can read what I wrote. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. Or, uh, levees and water diversions. Right. Okay. So, so, so this was stuff that was being tweaked um during that time okay uh uh what about the other one how about the next one um so this one was about kind of the the legislation that was introduced to help protect wetlands in the air in this time period a lot had to do with um, migratory birds and protecting birds is what i found and this just um it kind of highlights the few that are in here um, and then it also kind of goes into in like 1930 when the 10 year drought began, um, the Dust Bowl and all that. Yeah, 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 totally. Yeah, so, so again, Hunter, so we find in our surveys, which is the same thing people find nationally, is that fewer and fewer people identify themselves uh, as hunters, fit, people that fish. Mm -hmm. um, whereas back in the, in the, say, 1910s or 1920s or whatever, there'd be a much higher proportion of folks that would be, um, you know, hunting. And, and much of that wasn't for leisure or for fun, per se. It was, was to actually, I mean, people might enjoy that, but, but it was one of the motivations was just to get food, right, to get, to get stuff to eat. And so as we see this massive development, particularly the Midwest and the prairie regions of the U.S., where all these migratory waterfowl would use as we as we started draining those things, converting them to farmland, the hunters, the hunters noticed that the bird abundance was degrading, and so uh, in actuality, it was the hunters, especially um, duck hunters in, in particular, that um, really advocated for um, selling stamps and then using the the proceeds from those stamps to to man better manage and conserve wetlands and stuff. So absolutely, so the the Get the, the changing populations of game was a real key thing in, in terms of the public's realization that, oh, maybe we shouldn't just nuke these things. So hunters were key in that. Um, how, about, how about your third, how about your guys' uh, example number, or is it, yeah, I guess example two. Three. Or three, sorry, example three, yeah. sorry. Yeah, this one was about, um, I found a little article about the wetlands in um, Los Angeles and how basically the photo you're looking at now is what it looked like before. And if you scroll down, there's a photo of the same area now, uh, down one more. Mm. Yeah. So how it basically just got completely destroyed when people came in. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, so, so um, yes, figuring out what was historic is really, really hard. Um, and, and, you know, most people wouldn't, wouldn't guess this 
was this. That story I told last time about, um, or did I tell it in this class from other guys? I take it as the invasive species story about the, the, the guy saying how he liked all the purple and white flowers. Did I tell you guys that story? I think it's coastal. Coastal. Coastal, okay. yeah. coastal. Anyway, long story short. In this class. Yeah, long story short. I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll, we'll get into the story of Biona um, in, in a bit. But uh, yeah, suffice it to say, this, this place has been converted dramatically from what it historically was. So that's cool. So, so yeah, so back. So again, this notion of, at least it sounds like in your guys' era, that there is um, conversion and stuff, but, but there's still a, a, an understanding of or a beginnings of the initial phases of the understanding of the value of these, these areas. Um, so cool. All right. I like it. And then how about group number three from the thirties to the sixties? Um, so I picked the first example um, and the picture that I found was from the 1940s. So as you can see, this worker is spraying DDT into this wetland. Um, it was, at this time, you know, it was prior to the zeitgeist. So at this point, they're kind of seeing these wetlands as what they were, which was um, definitely expendable. They saw them as swamps that were full of disease and they would be better to, to be rid of them and to not, you know, um, try to understand the benefits that these systems have and that they will have in the future. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's what I got from that. Yeah, it's really hard to, to put ourselves in that mindset, but, but DDT was right, was perceived as this miracle thing, right? It was, mm -hmm. this, it was this great tool that, that it seemed to not hurt the dog, the cat, you, I mean, you know, all these disturbing photos and bit and-, and Bring the children. <laughs> yeah, yeah, his kids yeah. walking through it and just like, yeah, yeah. get up in your nose and stuff. And, um, <laughs> and, and, and it really was seen as a advance, right? So this guy was spraying this chemical. He wasn't spraying the oil as I showed uh, in the, the folks around Yale, right? So it was seen like, hey, this is this is a uh, this is a better thing. This is a science advancing thing. This is a highly targeted thing, and uh, it it really is dramatic how much we've changed our populations. The story I always think of when we talk about DDT and insects is my grandpa, who's who's passed away years ago now, but my grandpa used to take my dad and his family from San Francisco to Yosemite to go camp and, and all that kind of good stuff. And they would drive across the central Valley of California. And my grandfather who never smoked would always have it's like Columbo. He'd always have a cigar sticking out of his mouth uh, when they would drive and he would be chewing it all the time. And every, I don't know, 50 miles or so every so often they would stop, pull over the side of the road and he would bit on the windshield with his tobacco juice and that cut through the insects there were so many insects that within you know 15 20 minutes the windshield would be covered with gunk and this was you know i don't know what this was this was the 19 probably around the time of this 1940s or so uh you know that 1950s where where um, the insect populations were really, really numerous and our windshield technology or our wiper technology wasn't as advanced. And so, so he would have to do that just so they could safely see out of, the, out of the windshield. And you compare that to today, and now if you did that same drive, yeah, you get some bugs on your windshield, but if you didn't have any windshield wipers, you could get by no problem. So you know, back then there was a massively large amount of, of insects. The other story I'll say real quick about that, is um, I keep saying real quick, I, I, I ramble, but, but anyway, um, uh, one of my friends in the wake of Hurricane Katrina, one of my friends was uh, who did his PhD research in Louisiana and was now in California. Hurricane Katrina happened, all kinds of devastation, just like the folks are experiencing from Laura and other hurricanes at this moment back there. Anyway, he, he went back and and he went to visit, he was doing some stuff, and he went to visit a friend of his. And his friend said, hey, come over, have beers, we'll have dinner and stuff. So he went over to his friend's house. And this is, you know, summertime in the south, very hot, very humid. And he sat down, uh, and, and there's a porch, there's an enclosed porch with, the, you know, screened off porch. And he's rocking, and his friend went in to get dinner or the drinks or whatever and in, at nighttime. And he was rocking his chair and all of a sudden he got, you know, we talk about rhetoric, he got this very, very disturbing feeling. So he stopped rocking and 
he couldn't figure out what was wrong with the with the scene and he knew something was deeply wrong but he couldn't figure out what it was and he was looking around he's looking around he's looking around and he suddenly realized what it was was um there was no hum uh you know in my backyard probably in your backyard at night you know we go outside and you hear crickets you hear your bugs you're buzzing and stuff in in you know louisiana in any time of year it's not 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 a buzz it's a roar of insect life right it's like and there's frogs and all that kind of stuff and he realized there was no insect sounds and he looked across the street and there was a big street light where the light was uh you know sort of a cone of light shooting down from the street light and normally there's a gazillion million moths you know attracted to the light and flying around nothing and he got super freaked out and what it was happening was in the wake of Katrina, the Bush administration lifted or, or, or paused many, 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 many environmental laws that restricted how often we could apply pesticides, how close to schools and things of that nature. And they were so freaked out because of the large scale flooding that there was going to be a massive explosion in mosquitoes and therefore a massive explosion in mosquito borne diseases. They basically told everybody, spray all your chemicals as quickly as you can as frequently as you can everywhere you can and it had the 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 impact the the consequence of actually knocking down the insect populations tremendously and so so this notion of this person you know applying ddt that 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 fear and that worry is still very much so with us even though the rhetoric was 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 all positive uh back in the day cool all right uh, how about, let's see, uh, next one, uh, the w wetland water supply. So this was a meeting uh, for the geological survey, and they were talking about how the water supply is really understood at this time, but the effect of um, wetlands on the water supply is not understood. And there's been a lot of questions on what is a wetland and the purpose of the wetland and the function it has, especially when you're talking to different groups. Yeah. And this is a large problem. So they were saying that problems need to be analyzed in order to understand and clarify the role of wetlands in relation to the water supply. Excellent. So they understood that there was like a lot of development going on at this time and a lot of changes, but there wasn't a lot of understanding with these changes. And that was causing an issue, especially if you were a hydrologist versus a geologist. Okay, cool. Excellent. Thanks, Casey. That's great. Mm -hmm. So again, this notion of this, this birth of, of very powerful science. And so, you know, the science can, can harm wetlands, let's say, in the context of DDT and, and new ways to do development, but also this, this notion of trying to harness science to, to understand or communicate what, what's going on with, with our wetlands. That's great. Okay, how about you guys' next example? Yeah, so I had the uh, next article. Um, it was kind of hard for me to find just sure. um, things on wetlands, like on our specific date, but this is what, um, what I found. Um, this article talks about um, the legislation to protect the Long Island wetlands uh -huh. um, in this time period. I think it, uh, the article took place in the 1960s. Um, it also talked about two Republican lawmakers that introduced a bill that would provide financial assistance and help protect um, the Long Island area. Great. Yeah, again, I think, I think it, it, uh, it's unfortunate the way things have evolved where these issues seem to be politicized now, right? And we all know this, but but it's, it, it didn't always used to be that way, right? And in fact, if you talk to the wider public, people don't really, um, there's of course extreme people on all, on all sides, but, but in general, most people see the value now in, in preserving stuff. And this was, and this was sort of the, the early days of that, right? Or, or if not the early days, at least uh, um, um, a time when, uh, your political party didn't determine how you felt about, say, wetlands or, or restoration or conservation. It was more um, people saw it as, as a value, right? And, and as, it, as, it, as I think it should be seen as a value in conserving these things. That's good. Okay, great. How about uh, moving out from the 60s into the 90s? How about our next group? Yeah, let me add a picture real quick. 
so I found this uh, cartoon of Nixon. Did it post? Yeah, I, I give it, it, it probably, oh wait, here it is, yeah. yeah, it is. yeah. Yeah, so I found a cartoon of Nixon uh, chasing a will-o'-wisp through a swamp. And uh, this, yeah, the swamp kind of uh, was used um, in this time period to represent the war in Vietnam because a lot of that area is, like, you can't get out of the swamp and Vietnam is partially a swamp yep. in itself. So uh, Nixon here is chasing a will-o'-wisp called Victory. And a will-o'-wisp is commonly used to represent something that you keep chasing but can never achieve. So... Yeah, that's Nixon trying to find a way out of Vietnam. Cool. All right, great. Excellent. So again, that same, in a sense, that same rhetoric, although used maybe more in a different, used against a different, uh, the swamp represents something different, but still that uh, same idea of swamp is a hard place, a place that is full of struggle and we can't really get out of. So that's great. Awesome. Okay, how about number two? All right, so number two, this one's mine. All right, so during this whole, 60s, 70s, and 80s, there was a whole bunch of environmental movements, uh, mainly at the ESA. Uh, the EPA made significant advances in policy. And so you have all this legislation coming in. Um, and the science wasn't necessarily there to back up all of these policies. Like we, the, everyone just, just knew that we had to protect the environment, but the science wasn't up to date at that point. So we have, for example, the, water, the Watershed Protection and Flood Prevention Act, uh, which indirectly increased the drainage of wetlands near flood control projects. So you have this entire movement of uh, the government and like local agencies draining wetlands for what was perceived to be the benefit of and benefit and growth of cities. Mm -hmm. Yep, totally good. Excellent. So, so yeah. So, so in, the, in this this notion of the regulation, and, and now now we're getting to more of an era of not just pass a bill or two, but actually more robust um, structures for for uh, uh, caretaking of wetlands. Okay. How about how about the, you guys' next example? Okay. So I found out that the Emergency Wetland Resources Act became a law in 1986. And that's when there was more awareness and more education about the wetlands. And it has been increased ever since then. Yeah, great. Yeah, so, so the notion of, of uh, this is really when, when the ball started to shift sort of mid 70s to 80s about, you know, wetlands really, not, not just a few people here, there are communities, but really much more at a societal level, we got to think about um, conserving these things and, and moving forward. So that's good. That's good. Okay, group five. How about uh, our last? Our, is that our last period? Is group five our last period? Oh, I, I had two. Oh my God, I screwed up. I had two. No, 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 no. Okay, we're good. Okay, so the 90s. So the 90s. So group five, 1990s. So um, this one was mine. And what I had found was um, an article in the San Francisco chronicle and it's about them wanting to tear out wetlands in order to build 420 for 424 houses mm -hmm. um but the people come together because they're like no there's an endangered oak tree there that is um has a natural defense against the sudden oak death that's in that's been coming in and killing it everything mm -hmm. and you know, our, our wetlands are very important. And so the, the community came together and was like, no, we've stopped this two times before and we're going to stop it again. We don't want our wetlands destroyed. And I found that really interesting. Cool. Yep. Excellent. So, we're, so okay, that was in Nevada. Okay, yeah. So definitely I'd say that's, a, that's an area, it's a hotbed of, of environmentalism and a hotbed of awareness. So clearly at this point, we're starting to see that, that, um, well, I'll wait. I'll wait for you guys to keep talking. I'll wait for you guys, for you guys to finish your examples. Okay. How about example number two? Uh, for example number two, uh, it's from New York Times. It's about some uh, wetlands and salt, marsh salt marshes in uh, New York, and how they were actually being polluted and destroyed. And eventually, um, like the polluters, so like the example for like Exxon, uh, Exxon, there's some other companies in there as well. Uh, they ended up having to pay penalties and stuff like that for. Uh, polluting the wetlands. I think it was up to $70 million around there. Mm -hmm. 
So actually paying, you know, going from, you know, destruction now to like more like a restoration and restoration projects for areas that are actually affected by pollution. Cool. All right, Bueno. And number, number three, Lake Placid. Um, that's me. So it's a movie in the 1997 uh, film where it's a man eating saltwater crocodile, which is terrorizing <laughs> small town in Lake Placid. So basically it like resembles the famous movies of like, um, the wetlands are dangerous and like crocodiles need to be tamed and they need to be killed. So the whole uh, story of the movie is just to kill the 30 meter saltwater crocodile. There you go, baby. Danger, danger lurking in the wetlands. So, so we still have, so it's interesting, right? So we, so the first couple examples in this era are, are people um, uh, harnessing the tools that we've now created, right? To, to, to stop the destruction of wetlands, to foster, to foster their conservation or, or expand their amount, right? So that, that's cool. Um, uh, but yet, and this, we, I see this all the time, we, this, this notion of the, um, and I, I love a bad movie. I love, I love a, 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 a you know, schlock B movie kind of thing, just like everybody else does. Um, but it is interesting how the tropes they use, the rhetoric they use, the visual rhetoric, the, the terminology, the, the portrayal of what is scary tends to draw from these much older um, uh, 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 frames of reference. And so even though the law and stuff might go farther forward, you'll see the, the I don't know, the AMC or the, or the sci-fi channel or the you know, whatever um, specials will always have this kind of, you know, uh, the forest is dangerous, the wolves as evil, you know, that, that kind of thing. And so we still, we see that still persisting. So even though the overall societal um, perception or understanding or, or the rhetoric of wetlands might be, be going one direction, there's still this, this, this undertone of, of uh, we might call it ignorant or, or simplistic or old thinking, but it, it, it does seem to persist. Cool. Um, okay, and then how about our, our last group, our most recent time period? Yeah, so um, for this one, I think we scroll down a little bit. I put the image oh, on it. Cool. Yeah, there it is. Uh, I found this one. This is from 2018, so pretty recently. Um, and I think it's trying to play on the fact of how uh, legislation in this area has changed um, for the definition of a wetland. And it's more um, manufactured and artificial, along with the um, restoration efforts are highly um, appearance-based. And oh, does it look good, but is it not, is it actually functional? Yeah, super you can see it's like it's it's in a parking lot, so it's it's kind of a <laughs> the trees fake, the deer's fake, everything's fake. I love it. I have to use this. This this is my classic Walmart parking lot that I always, I always yeah. Throw out. So that's good. Awesome. Okay, cool, great. I love it. Okay, number next. All right. So this one is a very political cartoon, and it takes place in a swamp. And the woman that is pictured is the press secretary, Kaylee. And basically, it's just playing into this role that the swamp is like a dirty place. It's not, you know, it, it hides things, it's dangerous, and it's, you know, an old, an old rhetoric. And, you know, everything that's in here are controversial topics that are, you know, surrounding the Trump administration, and they're hiding, and... Uh, you know, there's crocodile in there, so it's scary, it's dark, and that's basically what these are. I mean, our political environment right now is obviously very heated and tense, and I think that shows a lot through this. Cool, cool. All right, I love it. I love it. Uh, and then your, your guys' last one. Okay, so <laughs> this is essentially just a picture of Trump's draining of the swamp and essentially saving America from the swamp itself. And he basically just goes on anything that he objects to is considered the swamp. He's kind of expanded that a little bit. And at the same time, he's also weakened a lot of the environmental regulations uh, as far as the runoff from agriculture that ends up just poisoning some of the disconnected wetlands that are in America. Yeah. And that was kind of the gist of what this picture is. 
I love it. You got the eagle going. That's awesome. Yes. I like it. There you go. So, and, and, and President Trump looks surprisingly thin in this cartoon. Yeah. So, uh, I like how the uh, flag on top kind of looks like it's a, like a golf course on the green. It is. It is. It's totally. Right? It's, yeah. it's the ninth hole or whatever the hell it is. That's great. That's great. <laughs> So that's very cool. All right, great, you guys. Good job. This is this was this was great. So so then just to summarize our, our most recent time period um, is this con more and more concern that the progress we've made is is maybe not as much progress as we like to think we've made, or or worries that what what is stated is going well might might in fact be problematic. So this notion of uh, yes, yes, we have water, but really it's not functioning well. This notion of um, uh, 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 wetlands still is this dark, dangerous thing in this wetland, and this notion of 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 um, portraying everything bad as as a wetland or 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 having wetland attributes, um, at least by some by some folks. So interesting. So we definitely seem to have been in this last in this last several years something of a of a uh, let's see, how do I say this? Well, we don't seem to be going in, in the same trajectory of, of wetland awareness and conservation and concern as we were in, in the you know, previous decades. At least that trajectory seems to be getting a little wobbly. I think, I think it's safe to say. Cool, awesome. Any other thoughts or any other insight? Oh my God, it's already 11 o'clock. Man, these times go by so fast. Um, uh, so it's time for our other, I guess it's time for our break again, but, but any other thoughts on that overall, what you guys saw any, any themes come out or any additional ideas kick in your head about, about the swamp, about wetlands, about how we, how we care for them. It's kind of interesting that through the years, um, we started out where we weren't really concerned about it. You know, it's, it's there for our use. And as the years have gone by, we're like, well, wait, now we're going to lose it. So it's a little more important now. And even with the governmentals and the politicians that are downplaying it, as they sometimes do for their own gain, the people have decided, you know what, it's still very important and we still really need it right now. And so as a population or the U.S., we actually are still very concerned, even though we're told that it's, it's not that big of a concern, calm down, you know. So it's interesting how the yeah. plays have changed through the years. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, and I think again, um, this isn't unique to just uh, wetland concerns or conservation concerns, but, but um, the general public um, definitely is more supportive of, let's say, wetland restoration efforts than, than the rhetoric might imply. And I think the, the public in general um, does see more value in healthy, well-functioning wetlands than maybe some of the rhetoric would imply. But, um, but again, it, 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 it's important to understand these. Um, it's, you know, so why are we spending this time talking about rhetoric? Why aren't we talking about restoration? It, it's, it's important to understand where our community is coming from as we start to design these restorations, as we start to think about the dynamics and the progress and all that kind of stuff because there will be um again most of the folks will be fine or or will probably probably be at least neutral with what we want to do the 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 problem from you guys designing you guys getting approved you guys enacting you all um um maintaining you know all the different phases of of say restoration um um doing restoration it's the most problematic people that will cause you the problem. So it's not necessarily 100% of the people causing you all problems. It'll be a vocal minority. And that vocal minority tends to rely heavily on their perceptions and understanding on a lot of this rhetoric and this cultural, this cultural rhetoric. So even though the majority of people support us, but you will need to address the concerns of, of maybe a bit more of the fringe population or the, or the, the, the most vocal population and, and you being able to understand where they're coming from rhetorically and being able to deploy these same tools in a way that educates folks, in a way that, that explains to them the value of, of why we're doing this, um, I think is really, really important. And so, um, so that's great. Other, other, other thoughts or any other people had, had things that popped in their head as we were going through these examples?
Okay. I don't know, kind of, oh, sorry. No, no one thing that I was, I couldn't find my Zoom. Um, one thing that I find interesting is that the amount of power that's given to the people that are able to determine the fate of, um, you know, the health of these systems and everything. I mean, it's just kind of a bummer that there isn't more of a, of a structure to kind of like allow there to be a balance. You know what I mean? Like the, the scale really tips and it's just, it's I'm, I'm not, so tell me more, Dan, I'm not, are you, are you talking about, you mean the, the decision makers, the, 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 the folks that are in an agency or something, is that what you're talking about? I mean, like in terms of polit like the, like presidential administrations, you know, I mean, they, they get to determine who's going to be running these agencies. And I feel like they can really skew things, you know, does that, does that make sense? Oh yeah. Oh no. To, to be sure. I would say yes. And, and yeah. And I, I don't want to get political here per se, but um, I would say you all are growing up or, or, or you all are living in this era right now of hyper politiz politiz politicization of all these things that shouldn't be political. The, putting a first class stamp on a piece of, on an envelope and sending it to my mom shouldn't be a political act, right? Um, um, telling people to uh, 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 mask up and, and you know, take safe, public safe, health safety measures shouldn't be a political act, but um, that's sort of where we are at the moment, unfortunately. But I would say that when you go back in time and look at not all, by any means, not all, but, but the vast majority of folks that let's say who were the head of the EPA, who were the head of agency X or Y at a state level, at a county level, um, there are exceptions of course, but by and large, most of those folks are, are well-meaning men and women. And they might have a different prioritization of the activities they wanna do say related to wetlands, but uh, they generally didn't hate wetlands. I guess I would say it like that, right? That, they maybe wouldn't prioritize wetlands, they maybe would prioritize something like rangelands or something of that nature, but it wasn't like an absolute F you to wetlands. Unfortunately, the era we're in right now, it, it's, it's a bit more of that sort of F you to wetlands kind of thing. But, and I, so I just would say that that's an aberration, that's a historical aberration um, in terms of the, the depth at which um, uh, the pendulum or, 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 or the, the, um, uh, magnitude at which the pendulum swings. It didn't used to swing that much in many of these agencies. And just recently uh, has it been, has it been um, seeming like whoever we vote for is radically gonna change how this agency works and how this law is implemented and how this say type of wetland is conserved or not conserved. Um, it, it used to be much more subtle than that in terms of the, uh, the political influence, but okay. Um, good, any other, any other thoughts before we take our break? I just saw that the United Nations is doing like a decade on restoration. I saw this is a little off turn. I mean, I know we need a lot more than that, but it's kind of nice to have a national backing knowing that we all need to do something versus individuals yelling at other corporations. It's going to start next year, I believe. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So in, in general, um, you know, we've, we've, we've made no progress without individual action in terms of resource management and, and, and improved stewardship of our, of our restoration and everything broadly writ. But as powerful as those individual actions, we really do need more larger societal buy-in. And we get that through uh, 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 corporate behavior and through governmental behavior, right? These state behavior, federal behavior, these large scale influences just cannot they're, they're, they're outsized compared to what the individuals can do. And so the reality is we need both of those things going on. And, and if we don't have any of that, that institutional support, it's difficult to make progress on whatever the, the ill we're talking about is. Yeah, for sure. Cool. All right. Other, 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 any other thoughts? All right, great. So let's take our, let's take our Tim. I don't even know what time it is. It's 11.09. So we'll, we'll come back at uh, 11.19. Everybody get up, stretch. Everybody get your power bar, hit the bathroom, whatever. I'll see you guys in, uh, in uh, 10 minutes.
Okay, guys, we've got about a minute or so here. Let me just uh, 